Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for September 12th, 2023. Uh, belated happy birthday to Gail. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, honey. <laughs> yes, I have a 9-11 birthday, y'all. My birthday is now forever associated with the Twin Towers. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we're streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by following up on last week's weekly tittle, which was called, Not Because They're Easy, But Because They're Hard. The assignment was to examine a tough decluttering decision to see what you can learn from it about yourself. We'd love to hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who took a shot at this tittle this week? Please let us know in the comments. <clears throat> YouTube viewer Iko reported on a decluttering decision that was giving her trouble. Iko says, growing up watching movies where there was beautiful dinnerware and even in our everyday lives to give to newlyweds, I hoped for China. After 10 years of marriage, I could finally buy a set, which was not common in Japan at that time. After using them only once or twice for 25 years, I always ended up using paper plates instead. My <laughs> local church held a wedding and reception and asked for dinnerware. When they tried to return them, I got the bright idea to donate them along with the linen napkins. Win, win. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that story, Echo. I think that we all have fantasies about how our life will work. And a lot of it's modeled from TV and movies, right? It sounds like you got the China and you used it a little bit every year rather than all the time, like you fantasized. And having realized that fancy table settings was kind of a fantasy that didn't have much of a place in your real life, you came in with a way to send them on. And how great to supply them to an event space where they're likely to get used all the time, depending on how booked that location is, how often the church uh, uses their event center. So a much better use of the China after all, and more likely that the whole, um, all of the place settings that you donated will get used every time, every sitting. And so what a great solution uh, and a way to not hang on to that fantasy every more, anymore and to not give up that space to storage in your kitchen anymore. Uh, you came up with a great solution. So good job. I'm well proud done. of you. Right? Uh Paula reports, I did one of those often overlooked yet easy tasks, went through hangers and pulled out a bunch that aren't being used. Some will go to the dry cleaners and others to the thrift store. It is surprising when I start collecting people's hangers in their closet and I purposefully line them all up in one place so that you can see, oh my gosh, I have two linear feet of empty hangers <laughs> and how much space, how much clothing space you're surrendering to the empty hangers and so good job for filtering those out and anybody that takes anything to the dry cleaner uh, regularly and comes back is going to have a million hangers that have gotten emptied and then don't get reused and they're just taking up they're just choking up your space and so gathering them and taking them back to the dry cleaner great job and you will feel the um, relief the the lack of pressure in your closet immediately from doing that so good job Naomi says, I tried to give my mother-in-law's Wedgwood set of 12 to any of her descendants. No one would take them. So yeah. I use one third of them when I have a dinner party. There you go. One third at a time. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and if you don't want to keep the whole set, you can donate half of the set. You can take six of it, a six place setting and give it away if you want and uh, let somebody collect six of it six place settings instead of 12 and like you they can have a smaller amount to store and they can have enough plates for almost all of the dinner parties they host <laughs> until um, unless they're a completely different 
unless they have completely different hosting capacities, they have uh, another responsibilities for uh, seeing a whole bunch of people at once. But a standard uh, have your best friends over for dinner, have a dinner party for somebody's birthday, you know, four or six at a time is probably the exact right amount for almost any household. So good job. M said on the tittle, I learned that I am clinging to the past as if holding on to the stuff will return me to happier times. We all have those memories associated with the things, right? And um, holding on to them are sort of visual triggers of the memories. And I totally get that. And I think you can sort of reach a happy medium between the two by picking of, of the things that remind you of a happier time, picking a few of them instead of all of them. It's easier to look at three or four things that trigger those memories and look at 150 things that trigger those memories. So the memories are all in your head anyway. You just want the visual triggers. And so reducing the number of visual triggers that get you to the memories means that you have possession of less of the stuff in your house. And you'll be amazed. Anything that triggers a memory is going to trigger the whole memory, not just a part of it. And so you really don't have to have as many things as you want, as you think, to pull up the memories that you're talking about. In a related response, Marsh says, as I w worked through some more piles, I stopped and realized I was living in a museum of the artifacts of my memory from childhood. Wow. Thanks for the push. Right. It's a great museum and <laughs> you, you can still get it down to a representative sample and have a little bit less of uh, all of the things. You know, you were a little kid. You probably had a lot of stuff and you don't have to have all that stuff to remember all the memories, right? Right. All right. I think we should get on to our main topic. Okay. The activities we do to relax, have fun and express ourselves enrich our lives in countless ways, but they can also bury our living spaces in tools, materials, supplies, reading materials, and unfinished projects. Today, we're gonna to examine the stuff that accumulates from hobbies, arts, and crafts, and offer strategies for keeping crafty clutter from spoiling <laughs> our fun. I've talked about this often over the years, mostly because I'm a longtime beater myself, so I know whereof I speak when it comes to organizing craft studios. I'm going to start by reminding everybody of my basics for organizing a craft or an art studio, but the basic principles apply to any creative handwork. For instance, if you're a model builder or a mosaics artist or a wreath maker, most of our hobby responses were related to creative outlets. So <clears throat> we're going to lean in that direction today. But if your hobby is more active than creative, like you like to go camping or you like to train dogs. You still have products and gear that need accessing and storing. And so the principles work for those activities also. We'd like to talk about ways that artists get hung up or lose control of their spaces and what to do about it too. So um, before we get into the strategies, let's talk about our survey results. We asked our audience to name the hobby, craft, art form, or other recreational activity that contributes the most stuff to your living space. And here are the most frequent responses we received. Sewing got 13 answers. There's a lot of sewers out there. Painting got nine. Scrapbooking at six. Knitting at five. Paper crafts at four. Collage, which is sort of another type of paper craft, is, uh, at three. Cross stitching at three. And card making at three. So clearly, y'all are very crafty people. <laughs> and you're doing a whole lot of crafts, which is wonderful. Um, we also got some responses around uh, mixed media art, crocheting, gardening, drawing, basket making, ceramics, quilting, dressmaking, sculpture, and genealogy. Um, all of these are crafts that I've seen in my client base, and I'm uh, excited that you guys are all such crafty people. That's wonderful. I think crafting is good for the soul. <laughs> I am. Um, I just got back from the retreat in Boulder, Colorado, uh, the bead retreat that I go to every year with my friends. And there's eight Texans, uh, who, eight of us who are all friends from Texas. And we, we always go every year and we had such a lovely time. And we spent three days beating together and then laughing and drinking and <laughs> having a great time afterwards. And it just, it, it was so 
uh, rewarding to craft in community and hang out with my friends and not worry about other stuff for a few days. It was very wonderful. There's a healing uh, that takes place when you are focusing on something that you find personally very uh, enjoyable, entertaining, and there's something to be gained from making space in your life for that hobby or that creative endeavor and, and allowing yourself the time and space to work on something. And it, it will refresh you and make you feel better. And so we want to encourage you to do that. And we want to talk about how you can make that happen, because as you'll see later in our presentation, some of the people uh, responded about how difficult it was because they were so over overwhelmed by their spaces. So we don't want that. We want you to be happy in your spaces. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about that. Let me, uh, th before you go on, let me throw out a couple more that have come in from the comments. Uh, okay. Uh, Deborah, Deborah mentioned soap making. Oh, yeah. Penny uh, used to do that. Samudra says, mine is, mine is writing. Mm -hmm. Catastrophe said, mentioned photo albums, paper crafts, jewelry making, wildlife rehab, wildlife rehab and pet upgrades. How do you upgrade your pet? <laughs> um, and also vintage antique restoration and tattooing. That is a very diverse list. Wow. Right. Clearly somebody who has tapped into all their creative um, expression veins they're like really letting it happen that's awesome we should all aspire and to have that much activity uh, loventa said i do design and animation on the computer painting on the wacom that's a you know tablet crocheting knitting traditional painting with gouache and acrylics did i pronounce that right um ink painting and painting bird houses sometimes wow that's a lot too Y'all are so crafty. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a great list and a studio problem. <laughs> I, I can hear that like when there's multiple things going on, it creates a little bit of a studio problem. So yeah, I can see that. Oh, that's wonderful. So here we also have a list of some unusual answers. Um, one I thought was interesting was recycling denim, that that was uh, one of the crafts that came up. I'm curious, they recycled the denim and they must do something with them. Um, <clears throat> jigsaw puzzles. Lots of people find that very soothing and relaxing to do jigsaw puzzles. Um, essential oils, dolls and dolls accessories, uh, saving and repairing family heirlooms and historical treasures, foam crafting, home remodeling. Okay, that's like my crafty nightmare. <laughs> home <Right>. remodeling. <laughs> that, would make, that would make me sad. Um, pouring acrylic paint art. I have, there's one of our beady friends who she does that and makes uh, cabs for um, jewelry making. And so uh, I really love the results of poured acrylic paint art. Uh, dog I have, training. I have a, I have a neighbor who does it as well. And she does uh, mostly flower pots. Yeah, yeah. But it's fascinating the way that it works. It's so, and it creates this such unique, colorful looks, the whole poured acrylic thing. It's really beautiful. The end result is really amazing. Um, dog training, horse figuring, collection, collecting, journaling, as Samudra mentioned, fountain pens, ink, and stationery as a hobby, and making toys out of recycled materials like that. Those are all great. Those are clearly, we have a very creative environment, a very creative audience, and I'm super excited about that. There is, there is something wonderful about tapping into that part, and it, it changes your focus, and relieves your stress and it, even when you're I mean I laugh about even when we're sitting in a bead room together and we're all beating on something and we're all muttering under our breath and cursing because something isn't working right or we're having to take something out or <clears throat> we tried something it didn't work we don't like it whatever none of that means we're not having fun <laughs> we're all still having fun even though we're you know muttering under our breath about uh, our not liking our negative results so it's still fun even when it's frustrating or irritating um eve who mentioned uh recycling denim says she makes denim bags with it oh gotcha gotcha i've seen those yeah and then you get to incorporate the pockets into the bag and everything the pockets from the denim jeans into the bag that's really cool i've seen those all right cool you guys are very crafty i love it so we're going to talk about the sort of the basics for any craft and art studio, 
I've applied these principles everywhere that I've gone where we have to work on a craft studio. And uh, I've done a special uh, video about it already. You can find that on our channel. But basically, all craft studios need some version of these four elements. First, you have to organize your main craft supply. And it needs to be an open, clear, easy access storage. It needs to be out like at a store so that it's easy to see and retrieve the next thing you need. And what is a main supply? So for myself as a beater, it's the seed beads collection, my seed beads. For a painter, it's gonna be all the paint tubes and all the colors and types. For a knitter, it's the yarn. Every knitting project starts with some kind of yarn and that's the main supply. For a scrapbooker, it's all types of paper. Paper is the main supply. <clears throat> so organizing all those main supplies is what I'm talking about first. Make sure your main supply can be selected and put away very easily so you can go get what you want and you can go put back what you've got. And that the collection is stored on or very near the work table. Depending on how big, you know, a bunch of yarn can't be all on the work surface because big uh, yarn takes up a lot of space. Fabric, for instance, takes up a lot of space. But you need a you need that wall of your main supply or that table or that storage unit to be very close to your workspace because it's what you're going to be going to the most often and you're going to be able to need to grab and go that main supply very quickly and it needs to be available to you. <clears throat> Next, you want to organize embellishment supplies and organize them away from the table the workspace, I mean, in a portable storage solution. So it can be brought to the work table when you need to. So what's the embellishment supplies? That's anything that gets added onto the main supply as an embellishment somewhere in the middle of the project. So for me, it might be buttons or yarns or metal, some kind of stamped metal pieces. Those would all be embellishments to my bead project. For a knitter, it might be beads. <laughs> that would be adding beads into the knitting process might be the embellishment or fabric or ribbons. For a painter, it might be paper or ribbons or torn pieces of fabric. <clears throat> Anybody that's doing um, sort of mixed media with painting as the main, as the starting point might be adding in all kinds of other things on top of their painted work. So uh, almost anything could be embellishment at that point. Generally, whatever gets added to the main supply in making any kind of an art piece is an embellishment supply. And you're really talking about a matter of proportions, like anything that is that isn't taking up a lot of the a lot of the process would be an embellishment. Try, yeah, try and sort of broaden the definition to cover more areas. Like for me, for in drawing, um, yeah. I would consider like the metallic pens that I occasionally will use to make to something sparkle. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are embellishments because that's only 2% of the time, you know. Right, and, and, and those metallic pens, you don't consider that to be, uh, a, 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 you're not grabbing that as a starting point when you, right. when you do the art, yeah, right? It's, it's never the primary <laughs> tool thing, primary medium, yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, and for you, you have a million kinds of pencils, but it's all pencils, right? Like it's all your, it's all a lead based pencil that you're working with in different hardnesses or, and maybe a little bit of color, different colors. Yeah. Some color but, pencil. Yeah. So yes, that's, a, that's the idea. Like there's, when you do an art or craft, there's the main thing that you do, the main supply that you use, and that's going to have the most variety. It's going to have the most options. You're going to collect the most um, you're going to collect them in the most variations possible. <laughs> so that supply that you go to first and is the base of everything that you do is the main supply. And then anything else that you would add in later is the embellishment supply and how you, because you add them in later and because you don't use them throughout and continuously that's why it makes sense to separate them from the main supply and have them be stored away from the table instead of closer to the table, because you're not going to get into them as often and you're going to use them and then put them back and not have them, you know, take up valuable workspace on the table 
or valuable space that's close to an easy reach to you from the workspace. Okay, make sure that the embellishment supplies are grouped by type and they're stored and labeled for easy retrieval. So when you want them, you can go get them for a current project. Store them elsewhere, not on the work table itself, as I said. The third category is tools. We all gather lots of tools and it's okay to sort them according to your, uh, these are my go-to tools and these are my backup or uh, specialty tools. Things that I only get when I'm doing a certain technique or a certain treatment or a certain, when I want a certain effect. <clears throat> Just like in the kitchen when you're cooking, there's the uh, cookware that you use 85% of the time. And then there's the stuff that you use 15% of the time, right? You can separate your tools in the same way. Put those go-to tools, the ones that you use most often, put them in a container that can hold them, that isn't going to fall over from the weight of the tools. You need it to be a sturdy enough container that can hold them. And put that container on the work table somewhere for easy access. You want to be able to reach out and grab while you're sitting and working. You want to be able to access your go-to tools right away without having to leave your space. And so those should be there. But if you try to put all of your tools in the tool bucket and have it all be on the work table, you know you got a million tools and you know you're not using them all. <laughs> and you know that if you put them all on the table, they're going to crowd out and make finding your go-to tools hard. So you're accomplishing two things. One, you're isolating your go-to tools so that you can get them quickly and easily and you can always find them. And then the other tools become backup, separation, um, you know, I need this for a specific treatment that I want to have. And then you can get up and walk away to those other tools. Let them be in their own container, not on the work table and in their own spot somewhere else in the, in the room. And they can be boxed up and stashed anywhere that you want in the room. And then you can just go grab the container when you know you want to do something extra besides the things that you normally use all the time. <clears throat> for you, that would be the gold pins that you only get out for very specific decorating. Yeah. <clears throat> in, well, in the case of drawing, I would consider both paper and and pencils to be my main, main supply. supply. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although paper, once you pick a paper, you're done picking. Like you pick the one paper you're going to work on for the project and then paper sort of off your list. It's a very initial choice that you make that then your choices stop after that until the project's done. Yeah. But for most things, I keep it in the, I, I work on it in the pad. And so, mm -hmm. you know, as, to, as long as they, as long as they'll stay in the pad. I'll right. Leave, right. I'll it gives you that work surface, right. So they fall out. Yeah. Mm. Well, so then you're selecting a pad. Right. And, yeah. but once you've done that, you're done for the project. So yeah. then your main supply becomes your plethora of pencils that you're going to use on the project. And that's going to change depending on like you picked there, you showed me one the other day that it was a black drawing It was black paper and you were drawing with a white pencil. I think it was white, right? White and white and silver and silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you were sort of doing it in reverse. <laughs> But, it, but same thing, once you committed to the black paper, then you, that was you're done with the paper selection. And then you were <laughs> on to now these are the pins that I use with black paper. And so you were then selecting your next portion of main supply out of your pencil supplies. So in a, in a, <clears throat> if, in a, if I had a dedicated space, mm -hmm. it would make sense to keep my papers less, you know, they don't need to be right at hand. I would get a piece of paper, put it on a drawing board mm. and not have to man it, not have to handle the paper again so it would really kind of be a secondary thing it could be racked somewhere yeah yeah, yeah. exactly okay. i mean and ultimately you're trying to give yourself on your workspace access to the stuff that you use the most often and separate the things that you don't get as often out of your workspace so that there's less in your way is the bottom line and so um, yeah, your little house, we got to, you have a little, you don't have a little corner where you can work. You sort of have to work where you are, right? So, right. But, uh, but a lot of people answering the survey sounded as if they have a similar problem. You know, they, they, they don't really have room a dedicated for a dedicated space. space. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And so parking those things in a way that you can package it or put it up if you need to because guests are coming over or you need to put it up because the space that you're working in has more than one purpose and you need to be able to clear the space of art in order for it to, you know, like you're working on the dining table and you need to be able to eat there. So right. you have to put it away from being an art space and, and make it a dining space again. That's the, um, that's the dilemma for everybody that's, that's working in a shared space. Okay. So I talked about tools and where to put the backup tools. The fourth category in a art and craft room is the reference materials. And by that, I mean, all, any of the books, the magazines, the class notes, photos, cutouts of magazines that you made, any kind of paper that is inspiration or instruction about how to do what you're going to do that you use as a reference material or that you follow as a pattern or that you, you know, you, you have a recipe that you're following um, in that uh, written material. And so all of that is the reference materials that you use for your art. So you want to get all of those pieces of paper in one place instead of all over your work table, which is usually what happens. You want to gather them all up and park them away from the work table. You can put them in or on any easy access bookshelf or cabinet in any room. You can search for the support materials anytime and see examples of how things are used. No need for them to share the same room. They don't have to be in your workroom if you don't have room for a bookshelf there. Or if you would like to have that space for something else, you can go put a bookshelf somewhere else and go put all these reference materials on a bookshelf in another room if you need. And then you only need one set of instructions at a time. Whatever project you're working on has those set of instructions. And maybe you have an inspiration piece. So you might need a, a few little sets of paper for any project you're working on, but you certainly don't need the whole population. And so having those materials in another room in another space you can go walk over there, get what you need, come back to the workroom with a few pieces of paper that you need for your job. And then <clears throat> the rest are out of your face and out of your way. Um, like all paper in the universe, even paper that is art instruction or inspiration can become chaotic and make a mess of your table if you leave it all right there with you. So um, giving it a dedicated sparking, parking space and moving it out of your work area gives you some more space for other supplies and it makes it so that those pieces of paper are not constantly being shoveled around on the top of your table as a pile of it, you know, burying your, uh, burying your work with uh, snow of paper. So that is the four main elements. And even if, even if you're talking about, you make a model, I was thinking about somebody who does like shipbuilding or they, they build, you know, Star Trek, or they build World War II airplane models. You know, all those model things have all these parts and they have paints and tools and glues and there's all this stuff involved in that. And so even something like that is going to have need the same, like here's the main supply, here's the embellishment supply. Like you can break this stuff up in the same kinds of collections and design your studio in the same kind of way and still be able to uh, build your model. So it really applies to almost anything. So there are things specific to craft and art studio jobs that are a problem um, <laughs> that, that help make your art and craft studio more chaotic, more cluttered, more crazy. And the very first one that is very specific for crafty people is creative people see the potential in all things. And so they're really reluctant to let things go that could have a creative use. And because they can see the possibilities that others who are less creatively inclined cannot see, creative people save a lot more. And actually what they're doing is they rescue many things that others would, would throw away as useless. Like, oh, that's trash, boom. And an artist is going, no, that could be used for fill in the blank. So um, all, all creative people struggle with this impulse. Um, it's an arguably useful skill. And it can also create a lot of clutter in your workspace where storage and workspace come at a premium. It's important to learn to leave some things behind. Not all potential can be realized by you. And you don't have to be the keeper of all potential that you run across in your lifetime. 
some things with potential just need to keep on flowing along the river of stuff until they land where some other artist who sees uh, realizing the potential at the top of their project list and they can pick it up. And so um, you will see the potential in all things. That is the definition of being an artist and having that vision, that artistic vision. And you don't have to be the one that realizes it all. So looking at it and going, that's cool. is probably not, enough of a reason to keep it you really need to have a much stronger reaction than that because you're only going to work on the projects for which you have the really strong reaction anyway all those other things you're like yeah yeah that could be useful for something that's not enough of a reaction from an artist for it to ever come to the top of the list so um, know that you're going to be inclined to grab and keep things and know that you in order to not drown in your potential collecting you, you need to see the potential and go, yeah, yeah, but not by me and release it back in the wild again. Like, don't, don't take it all home. <laughs> Fight the urge. Another problem that we, we referenced earlier, um, a lot, a lot of people who are creative are interested in more than one discipline. They find more than one type of craft fascinating. And so if you're a serial crafter or an artist that's interested in multiple disciplines or you're an ADD person who switches from one form of art to another as your interest shifts, uh, keeping materials for several crafts is a great challenge. And when you have more than one interest, you need to have more than one workspace and are uh, also more than one storage system for the items related to each hobby. And so managing that, creating a workspace that's dedicated to each craft you're into and creating a storage system for each craft becomes a management chore that you need to do in order to support your multiple interests. And it adds a level of complexity. You know, I'm all about the beads. And so my studio is all about the beads and things related to beads. I'm not trying to paint over here. So I'm not trying to do Ed's drawing. So I'm not having to manage other materials in my, in my craft studio. But if you do have that interest, and I have set up storage, I have set up craft rooms before with more than one craft in mind. It's important to isolate the materials from each other, um, separate, uh, find separate storage spaces for each collection and a workspace that either works for all of them or has a station for each of them, depending on how closely related your crafts are. You may be like you're into paper crafting and so you do all kinds of paper crafting. Or maybe you're into book binding and beading, and those have absolutely nothing to do with each other, right? So it depends on how related your crafts are, how you might want to set up the workspace. But separating them in your space becomes important so that you're not digging through soap materials while you're trying to do your beading project. You don't want them all on the same work table. That's part of how you manage those lovely interests that you have. I will say that one, if, if you do work that requires water, um, having wet workstation and a dry workstation is really important. And it's important not to cross the two because usually the things that you do with wet work will de destroy dry workspace. <laughs> so you want those to be separate and you need different tools for both. It's important to make those um, be physically separate and be on you know separate cabinets, separate tables, and that you don't share the tools between them because usually um, what you do with water will destroy what you do dry. Um, it's not necessarily the other way around, but there are things that water is supposed to be introduced to and things that water are not supposed to be inter introduced to. And so you really want to make those stations completely separate. And that way you don't end up cross-contaminating your work when you when you work on your wet versus dry stuff. Another problem that people have is they have crafts that share supplies. Like you have this kind of paper and it would work for this kind of craft and that kind of craft both. Um, <clears throat> most of the time it's best not to share the supplies between the two if you can help it. Or, or if you have like, this is a fancy paper and I would use some of it in junk journaling and I would use some of it in scrapbooking. I would actually split the supply so that the junk journal supplies are in one place and the scrapbooking stuff is in another place. If you run low on one side, you can go pilfer from the other side. But I think it's easier instead of 
walking back and forth between a, sh a, a shared supply. I think it's easier to sort of divvy them up between the two. And then if you have to go steal, you can go steal from the other crab. But as uh, keeping them separate means that you're not filtering through that much more material when you want to go do junk journaling. And I reference that because I have a client that does uh, mixed media work and she does junk journaling. And the things that she does for junk journaling, the things that she picks for junk journaling, imaging and such are different than what she picks for collage work or mixed media work. And so there's a lot of magazine cutouts, but they get used differently. Uh, oh, okay. So what, how do you define junk journaling? I've never even heard of that. So junk journaling is you take junk paper and you create um, handmade journals. And so they do things like um, a used envelope, any kind of piece of paper, they're basically recycling waste paper and turning it into art. And do they and bind, so, it, bind it together? Yeah, there's, you know, handmade binding, glue binding, that kind of stuff. Um, it's really, it's fascinating. If you do, if you Google junk journaling, you'll be amazed. There, <laughs> you know, take little, make little envelopes and glue them in. So there's a little pocket in your junk journal. They do all these things to capture and recycle junk paper that it, in essence would be recyclable paper otherwise. And so there's lots of things that she collects for that that she wouldn't use in other um, paper crafts. And so there's a little bit of cross pollinating, but basically the, the, the materials to get used for junk journals are different kinds of paper. And so, but the, the, you know, all paper can share paper among, all paper crafts can share paper across, right? And so I would just, I, we try to keep those things separate. And, and if she has to go and pilfer from one side or the other side, that's not a big deal, but- <laughs> generally keeping them separate. Naomi says, no, no, don't tell us about another new craft we could try. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have a client who has been doing it for a long time. That's why it's one of my reference points. <clears throat> um, another problem that artists have is not wanting to break down or put away unfinished objects, UFOs. And as a result, UFOs tend to uh, take over the studio and they, they take up the workspace. And then if you are a person that switches from one, if you work on more than one project at a time and you switch around, it makes it very hard for you to switch around if all the UFOs are open. And if you don't have a lot of time to work on your craft and you can't like come back to it every night, if you can only work on it on Saturdays or, you know, you work on it for four hours here and then you don't pick it up for three weeks until you work on it for four hours again, um, Leaving it out for the three weeks between your attention, your time and attention means that it's sort of creating some chaos on the work table that makes the work table hard to approach. And so figuring out a way to store those UFOs at, while their work's in progress is important. And I think devising a case that you can put things in because you pulled out all of the supplies you might want to try and you've got the instructions and you've got the half finished project and you've got um, some pieces that you might be adding in later. And all of those things are part of the creative process as you design and think about your work. You're like, oh, I might try that. I might try that. Like, we might add this element, yada, yada. And so you pull all those and you don't want to lose your creative design process in the middle. And if you don't look at it for a month, you might not remember what you did. And so having a container that you can put a UFO in with all of its pieces until you can come back to the project allows you to not lose your design ideas. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to not have to go where are those beads that I was using over here in this corner. I need more of them. And I don't know where that tube is. You don't want to lose track of what you already got into the, the work. And so <clears throat> it's important for UFOs to have a way to be put away. Even if it's just you shove it all in a Ziploc bag and put the Ziploc bag in a shoe tree holder um, on the on the doorknob or um, some of the stuff you're working on is probably bigger. And so having bigger containers is important. But I think, you know, thinking about a way to identify a container that you can put it all in and that's your UFO, you know, it's the UFO box. Um allows you to 
start another project while you still got go one going on. And it also allows you to not lose pieces when there's p long stretches of time between when you can work on something. And that's important. You don't want to lose the bead that you have in your head. Like I'm using that color. And if I lose the tube in the middle, then I'm screwed. So, you know, you, you want to be able to keep up with the pieces. Yeah. I'm, I laugh about, I think of UFOs all the time. We, we've, use that phrase for a long time so i don't think of it as a surprise but i saw somebody laughing about it having seen the word ufos all artists have unfinished objects in their studio it's a thing <clears throat> so i'm i'm wanting to go because we're getting close i wanted to go on to the uh, survey responses we asked our audience to describe the part of the activity the, the primary activity they, they mentioned that contributes most to the clutter in your home um, D said, I work on some type of craft every day after work to decompress. It makes it very hard to clean up if I have a certain project I'm working on that takes more than one session. I leave everything out. So that's a, that's a little bit of what I was just talking about, right? Like it's an unfinished project. And if you can come home and work on it every day, that's great. And even so, I might have a container. Maybe, maybe it's just an open tray. Maybe, you know, like think about a cafeteria tray or a, um, a a tray that you would have in the kitchen that you would go and carry food from one place to another. Even just a tray with the project that you're working on so that maybe you don't have pets and it's not an issue. I don't know. The, I always have the possibility that there's some cats going to walk across my work table. And so <clears throat> having those having those parts be even to just put it in a tray, open, shallow tray, and go be able to put that tray on a bookshelf somewhere, um, cleans off your workspace, prevents you from losing your work, and you could still pick it up and put it down at, at the end of the workday. I mean, at the end of the, after you've done your craft for the evening, um, you can still put the stuff on the tray and put the tray away and have it be not be out so that I don't know where you're doing the crafting. I don't know if that makes a difference in terms of if people come over, do you have to clear off the table for them to sit at, if you're going to eat something or it's on the coffee table in front of the couch while you're, because you work at night on the couch or depending on how you go about having your fun, um, it could impede on other activities in the space. And so um, even if it's just putting it into an open tray and filing that somewhere on a shelf, uh, I think it would be useful and it means that you won't lose uh, information you won't lose parts and if you have if no one else lives there and you have no pets and you have no visitors then you know maybe you can leave it out nobody's going to touch it. it's not going to be a problem but if you don't like the look of it or if any of those other things are true then you still need a way to cope with it right so there you go an anonymous respondent said Magazines and loose pictures for collage take up boxes and boxes or are lost among other papers. There you go. You just described what happens if you don't keep all of your reference material separate somewhere else <laughs> and you don't have a storage system for uh, all those loose things for collage, right? So the client that I'm talking about who does a lot of collage and we have lots and lots of images and for a long time, um, she resisted my <laughs> attempts to organize her images, um, but we finally managed to get it down to, we created some categories of images without doing too much sorting work. Like no artist wants to spend a whole bunch of time organizing their, their cutout pictures, right? Loose collage pictures. Nobody wants to do that. And so we made some large categories, one of which was background. And then we had um, small, medium, and large uh, ephemera. Sorry, ephemera is what I'm looking for. Small, medium, and large ephemera. So we really just sorted it by size so that we could store it. You know, this little box has the little ephemera in it. This long or shoe box has the medium ephemera in it. And then this larger square scrapbooking box has the large ephemera in it. And that was a, just a way that we could cut out the image that she wanted and not have all the excess paper around it and then just store it by size. 
<clears throat> now there's a few, like she has a few themed boxes. One of the theme boxes is holiday. So anything that was related to Christmas, Halloween, yada, 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 very specific images. Um, that was one category that was big. And so it was easy to put, pull all that stuff separately and make it a category. And um, what's, there's one other category. Uh, one that's labeled a spiritual. And so there's some religious imagery and some, you know, angels and that kind of stuff. And that was a big collection for her as well. And so we isolated two big topics and then everything else we just sorted by size. And now a massive amount of images. I can't even imagine the thousands of images we sorted, but they're all contained in some little box. And so when she wants to use some of those, she pulls down a box and then she does the artist thing of flipping through the box, looking for the stuff. Oh, this inspires me. Oh, this goes with my project. Oh, this makes sense for what I'm doing. And so um, she gets the fun of filtering through her own collection to be open to the inspiration of what could be used and what might be appropriate for her project. And yet it's not all spread out all over everywhere because she is using her dining table for in her, uh, in a small condo, she's using her dining table for her arts and crafts and she does computer work on it and she eats there. And it's like her main table for everything. And so we really needed a way to get it under control and she didn't have huge amounts of storage space to hold it all. So um, ultimately getting it down to three storage boxes of varying sizes was enough. And she has a gazillion images. And so we've all, we've had this long discussions about <clears throat> how many images is enough, um, you know, and, and she's gotten to the point where those containers being full are enough for her to play with and filter and find what she needs. And so uh, I know she can never in her lifetime use all of the things that we boxed for her. And so she has plenty to pick from and she's never going to run out. <laughs> that is the, that's the truth. And so if you do a paper craft, managing those um, cutouts and images and the magazines, I challenge her all the time. You're saving this magazine because you want two pictures out of it. Let's stop and cut the pictures out and recycle the magazine and put the pictures in your, um, in your image collection system, because the magazines just become, they grow much faster. And you know, you get, you want three images out of the magazine. That's three half pieces of paper and then there's another 80 pieces of paper that are causing you trouble. So um, managing that paper and finding a way to store them that you can then flip through and make your choices from is important. And getting all the other paper, class instructions, books, mag reference, you know, training magazines, things that are explaining how to, getting those out of the workspace and stored somewhere else as a reference library and is also helping to remove the lost among the papers on your workspace comment that you made. <laughs> well, I wonder too, if this, this, this respondent was talking about other papers, uh, non, you know, papers non -craft, not related right? to the craft. So mm. here's, you know, here's where I drop the mail every day. And today I found this cool th thing and pulled it out of a magazine and I dropped it on the same pile. So, you know, at the very, it seems like at the very least, start that, you know, big bucket system where the mail goes in one slot of an accordion, if you're not dealing with it every single day. Yeah. And the craft stuff to be dealt with later goes in another slot or its own. Yeah. Two separate um, bins, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Separating those functions is super important because you don't want a bunch of magazine um, cutouts that you're going to use for collage in amongst your bank statements, right? So, and you definitely don't want your bank statements in your artwork. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that, that, you don't want to be creating art that exposes your financial data. So <laughs> no, you definitely. definitely want to separate those into different systems. And yeah, I mean, and this is the ultimate where, you know, an artist will see something in a piece of mail and say, ooh, I want to keep that image. And then they throw they throw it down as a keep 
um, but they don't go the rest of the way and go, okay, now if I'm going to keep that image, I need to harvest that image and put it in my image collection system because otherwise it's going to float around and be lost, as you say. And so adding that extra step, where do my images, where do my collage images go and making it go there is the, <laughs> is the big challenge for most artists and worth the effort. Okay. I think we have time to answer just a couple more. Um, okay. On the same, in answer to the same question, Diana said, I have the fabric more or less under control, but the tools are still many and scattered. I rounded up all my different kinds of scissors and put them in an easy to view bin. My electric cutting dies are all over. Don't know if I will ever use them again. And the complex and many assorted rulers for marking and cutting, I honestly don't know if I will ever use any of this stuff again. This is an example where you did electric uh, electric cutting dies. You're using them, but you're not sure you're ever going to use them again. So, A, I would go find yourself a storage box. And if they're all over, start pulling them in and, you know, boxing them up as a set. And then put the set away and see if you miss them or if you suddenly have an, an inspiration to use them. And if you don't for a while, then I think you can take that whole collection and donate it away to an artist that is in the middle of using them and would love to have them. Um, but certainly at the least, getting a bin and pulling all of those things together and off of your work table, especially because you're not using them. And the same with the rulers. Get a bin, put the rulers in the bin. And uh, you may want to pick a few of the rulers to keep, and you may want to box up and release uh, the majority of what you collect. But at the very least, because you say there's a, you know, a complex and many assorted rulers, then pulling all those into one container lets you, A, know how many, many, many there are, <laughs> And then B, let you filter them as against each other as this is more useful than that. I use this one more often than that. I like this style better than that. And so it, it allows you to look at the whole population of rulers and then pick your favorites and then release the rest and get all of them from, you know, off your chaotic work table, basically <laughs> getting them out of your hair. Okay, we also asked our viewers and listeners to describe how the cluttered state of stuff related to that principal activity negatively impacts your ability to carry out or enjoy the activity. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of uh, answers along the lines of, I don't know what I have. I, I, I don't know what I ha have to use. I'm overwhelmed with finding the supplies I want to use. And I hope we've kind of answered that question already to some extent. Uh, so I want to just share one more. Glenna says, I'm currently not doing any collage or artwork because the space is not conducive to working in. This negatively affects my life by hindering me from having the joy of creating. It also pre prevents me from having friends come over to play and enjoy our time too. That about sums it up. Oh, and that did that makes me sad. Like as an, as somebody that likes to do beadwork in community with friends, I totally get the joy that you get about having your friends come over to play and work on it and not being able to do it because you feel like the space is not conducive is it. I can see why that is a hindrance and is negatively affecting you. And we want to change that. So I think deciding that I mean, you have a space limitation, you're working in a specific space and it may be time for, you know, a craft room overhaul where you, uh, if you're not doing any work anyway, then um, tearing up the studio to rebuild it isn't going to impact you directly in terms of not doing your art. And if you can spend the time to fix your studio to a useful state, to clean it and clear it, uh, it would be worth the effort so that you can get back to doing your craft. Any studio takes a huge amount of work to rebuild it because we start out with so little and over time we, you know, the collection gets bigger and bigger and bigger and we've done more and more work and we've added more and more skills and it, everything just gets more elaborate and more multipled and <laughs> there's just more of everything. And we often don't plan our space to grow with all of our accumulation. We don't plan for that. And so coming back to a studio that has been useful before and is now 
not and needs an overhaul is is usually a very big dismantling disruptive task but if you can do it and subtract the materials that you're not into anymore and sort everything out better so that you can access it and reset up the workspace so that you like how it functions then you're going to get back a very rewarding experience of working on your particular interests and being able to have friends come and join you to do it as well so worth the effort and, and it may take a while like I rebuilt studios from scratch and we spent you know five 12 hour days trying to do it it may take you many many hours to rebuild but if you're not doing anything anyway and you already feel uncomfortable and happy about it if you have to destroy the workroom to rebuild it, it, it the end result will be worth it because right now nothing good is happening so you might as well face up to the suffering and rebuild your studio and then be an easy breezy happy artist again and that's the end result we we're looking for there and and you keep saying studio but we we should also say or the portion of room that you yeah wherever you're doing purpose, your thing yeah where the, whatever your work surface looks like to rebuild your cubby your craft cubby hole whatever your it cubby is, right whatever your, whatever your space is your portable um you know collection of stuff if it's out of control and it's overwhelming you and preventing you from doing anything it's time to sign up for a you know a creative rebuild okay we are off next week we will not have a show next week because gail is going to be where for the board meeting Oh, in Minneapolis. I have to go to Minneapolis for a board okay. meeting, Naples board meeting. So excellent. I'm, I went there once for a conference. I'm going to be sitting in a boardroom talking at right at Tuesday at noon. So I will not be able to do this instead. But we will be <laughs> back in two weeks on Tuesday, September 26th at the usual time. Mm -hmm. We will announce a topic soon. So watch your email. Why don't you give us the tittle? This week's tittle is creative playtime. We'll be back in two weeks, and the assignment for that interval of two weeks is to dedicate some time to practicing an activity that you enjoy. We're going to let you have some time off. So schedule a block of time to work on the hobby or art form or craft of your choice. Make sure to allocate time to clear a space in which you can work. Allow time at the end to clean up and put away your supplies and materials. Have some fun doing your art, then come back and tell us about it want to hear that you guys got a little creative over there and come and show us some of your work okay if you're watching this on youtube we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events we invite you to join our meetup group by visiting cfhou.com meetup you can also follow us on facebook by visiting cfhou.com facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com subscribe we love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. We love to see you guys every week. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it, and I hope that uh, this inspires you to get a little creative for the next two weeks while you have um, no clutter fairy to talk to you. <laughs> go, go have, take your time off and go have some fun and come and tell us about it next week. And we will see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.